Hey everybody, welcome to today's live chat. I'm Angela Walters and I get on here every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central to talk about quilting. If you have been to any of my previous chats, you might notice it looks a little different here. I'm actually gonna do a live demo with the chat. So I've done this once before, everything went well, so fingers crossed that we won't have any problems this time around either. Now what I'm gonna be doing in this live chat slash demo is talking about how to combine quilting designs to create interest in the backgrounds of your quilts. Now this is actually the first in a two-part series. So in this live chat, I'm gonna show you how the technique works, how to have fun mixing up your different designs, and and then in the next week's live chat, I'll take it a step further and show you different ways to use the technique on your quilts. You'll be surprised that you can take two basic shapes and create stuff that looks so intricate and difficult. And you don't have to tell your friends it was easy. I won't tell them it was easy. They'll just be super impressed. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Now I have Jessica here. She's monitoring the chat. So if you have a question, you can type it out. And as I'm quilting, she'll actually stop me if something comes up and, and ask me in real time or she'll save it for the end. So this is a really great way to get those questions answered, make it a little bit more interactive and have a really fun time. So so without any further ado, let's get ready for the quilting. I'm going to switch it over real quick. This setup will let you see my face, but also my hands. I know sometimes it's good to see how the design flows. So when I talk about combining designs, I'm not talking about a motif. I'm talking about putting them all together to create another all over design. And it's actually pretty easy. So what you're going to do is you're going to first start with the bigger elements that you want to combine. These are designs that need a little bit more space to come together or a little bit more room to develop. So that could be a feather, it could be a swirl chain, it could be um, anything that's a little bit bigger. And so you're gonna quilt a couple of those. So I'm gonna start with some swirls and then we'll see the next step. Now, one thing I want to point out is that these designs aren't necessarily less dense than the rest I'm going to put around it. They are the same density. They just need a little bit more space. So I quilted my swirl and I'm going to add my flower. And then I'm going to use a smaller design or a design that doesn't need as much space to develop to fill in any of the gaps. That's probably the trickiest part to combining designs is dealing with any irregular spaces that show up. Now in these areas, you could do things like pebbles, a meandering line. It could be a back and forth line, just a design that doesn't need a whole lot of space to develop. So right here, maybe I'll add just a meandering kind of loopy line to fill in that weird little shape. Then once you have it all kind of filled in, then you can start adding another bigger design. Now there's no right or wrong here. That's so for the perfectionists out there, this might be a little tricky. You might think, oh, I want to do it the exact right way. Just quilt whatever you feel like quilting. If you feel comfortable with swirls, stick with that. If you feel comfortable with a different design, definitely do that. I'm also not worried about the ratio of designs. I'm, I'm not worried like if I have a flower here, should I put a flower over there? I'm just filling in the space as much as possible so that I don't have any gaps. All right, so I'm gonna add another swirl. I'll do a swirl chain, a little bit more of an elongated swirl. And then in that little space between them, again, switching to one of those designs that don't need as much space to develop. Um, let's go ahead and do some pebbles. The most important thing with this technique is I don't want to leave any gaps in the quilting. I think people will notice a gap in the quilting before they notice an error. So I'm just making sure I handle any of those irregular spaces before I move on. Now I'm going to add um, some leaves and some other designs. You don't have to use as many when you're doing this technique. You could just alternate between two. And you can also quilt them so that they're less dense. You can move those lines further apart so that it's not quite so densely quilted. I just like quilting my quilts to death, so that's why I do it that way. All right, so let's add some leaves, maybe something a little bigger. Again, I'm not talking about the spacing between the lines. I'm talking about something that just takes up a little bit more space. And 
And then again, in those little areas, adding in my, my filler design or my design that doesn't need as much space. I'm gonna do a back and forth line in here, just for fun, for funsies. And as soon as that little area is filled in, I know it's zoomed in pretty good, but as soon as that's filled in, then I'm free to go on to the next one. Now, I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna keep filling this area so you can kind of see how it progresses. But let's also talk about how you can move around the quilt because sometimes you get stuck in an area you don't wanna get stuck in or that you didn't mean to get stuck in. So I'm doing another flower. And then if I wanna move over to the other side, like maybe I have a gap over here I wanna deal with, I can use echoing at any time to do that. Now, echoing is just quilting around what I previously quilted to get to that spot. So if I wanna get over here by this leaf, I can just use that echoing to move over there. The reason it works is because I'm gonna keep the spacing between my echo lines the same as the rest of my design so that it doesn't stand out. And then once I get where I'm going, I can pause, I can think through the next design I wanna quilt, I could even trace it out with my finger to give me kind of an approximation where it's gonna go. But once I know what I'm gonna quilt, it's just time to quilt it into that area. You'd be surprised by which designs you can actually combine with your quilting. Things that you might think of as motifs, like feathers, work great in this, in this uh, technique because I can just fill it in the space and then fill around it. Um, so really kind of use your imagination to think of the different designs you can throw in here. What's great about this is that you don't have to commit to quilting this big, elegant feather over the whole quilt. I can just throw a little guy in there, decide that's enough of that, and then move on to a different design. How's everybody doing, Jessica? Any questions? Several. Several? Okay, good. How do I know if I need to go inside or outside of a swirl? I get confused. Good question. How do you know if you need to do an inside or outside echo of your swirl? The short answer is it doesn't matter. Just echo. But I'll show you what I do. So let me start with my first little curl. Now I'm doing an elongated swirl, so it's nice and long. It has that tail right there. Now from this point, I've started my curl, now I need to finish that swirl. It's the most important part of this design. That means I need to echo my way back around. From this point, I could echo around the outside of my swirl, or I could echo inside of it. Either way is fine. I like to echo inside. Now, if you're not sure which side is which, the next swirl I quilt is gonna be smaller than the first one. So I'm gonna echo inside to here. So that's kind of what I have there. And then I'm gonna just echo it around the whole thing again. So kind of work my way around. Such a good question. That's a very common question. Now this is specifically for the elongated swirls. Um, it does seem like when I'm doing like a regular swirl meander, I might just swirl in and then go around the outside. But truly it doesn't matter. Just keep echoing no matter what you do you'll end up at the bottom of the swirl and that's where you need to go so short answer is it depends on the type of swirl um, and really just practicing will help you get the hang of it so now I'm over here and I want to get to this gap over there right I like to treat this quilting like a blob I know it's not very like attractive sounding but I don't want pieces going in all different directions I want to handle any of those gaps before I move on because let's be honest I know myself I'm gonna get done with the quilt and realize I've missed a whole spot. It has happened, so I like to take care of it while I'm there. So here's a perfect example where I'm gonna echo around, get into that spot, and then fill it with my design that doesn't need as much space to develop. So I've already done some pebbles and some back and forth lines. How about something a little unusual, but one of my favorites, the wishbone. Now the wishbone is not a design that you might think of as a filler design, but it does work in between two defined areas. Now on the live chat before we got started or on the text chat, a lot of questions about wishbones and ribbon candy and I'll be doing that soon in a whole separate live chat for itself. But for right now, I'm gonna fill in this area doing my wishbones. The reason I love wishbones is they fit all of those irregular areas. So as my space is really skinny or gets wider, it's gonna fill that area in really nicely. And I'll finish this, I'll kind of turn it so you can see it.
And then once I run out of space, right, so now I don't have anywhere else to, to defined areas, I'm just gonna go right into my next design. I'm not even gonna you know, stop or touch anything. I can just go right into a swirl or something else. Now, the trick to quilting wishbones, the, the short little trick I'll give you right now, teaser for the live chat where we talk about it, is I want these lines to be parallel to each other. As I come around and quilt the next one, if they're parallel to the previous one, that's gonna help it progress the way it needs to. If you have a problem quilting it and all of a sudden it kind of starts going wonky, check that, because that's usually the thing that, that kind of throws people off. So wishbone's not your typical filler, but definitely um, one I like to use a lot for those kind of areas. And again, now that I ran out of room, I'm just gonna go right into my swirl or whatever design I wanna do and continue on. Paisleys are also a really good kind of filler design because they kind of squeeze into those tiny little spots right there. Really, it doesn't matter just as long as I fill in any of those areas. And we can kind of get a little hint right here, a little peek of the quilting. It's all one big blob. There's no big gaps standing out. And all the designs are fairly similar in density. So not one single design stands out. In this particular example, that's what I'm trying to do. I, I don't want you know, the one design to stand out more than the other. I want them all to kind of blend and, and just kind of create this beautiful texture and interest. Now, next week, we'll see where we change that up a bit. But for right now, that's the rule that, that we will follow. And that's how we'll do it. So another little swirl again. With those elongated swirls, I make my next one smaller by working inside of it. And that's just because swirls get harder to quilt as they get bigger. So if you're quilting swirls and they get really big, you could be going around the outside too many times and that just builds it up faster. Um, but again, there's really no wrong way to do that. And then filling in those gaps. All right, Jessica, any other questions? Do I uh, decide my design before I start quilting? I'm asked that a lot. Um, it depends on the design and the quilt and, and what's going on. For this particular technique, I'm not. I'm just kind of making it up on the fly. Um, I like to joke that it'd be funny if you had friends around you that were yelling out designs that you had to quilt and kind of help you mix it up. But honestly, I'm not overthinking it. And now that's because I do have the benefit of a little bit of practice, so I'm not too stressed out about it, but um, I don't usually plan them out beforehand, especially for this technique. But again, that's just me. You might do it differently, and that's fine. Any other questions? What machine and needle am I using? This is a Handy Quilter Stitch 710. It's their sewing machine. I'm a Handy Quilter long arm dealer, so of course I, I use their sewing machines. And then this needle is a titanium top stitch needle. I love them for machine quilting because they're stronger and they stay sharper longer. And when you're machine quilting and moving the fabric, you want all the strength you can get. It kind of really helps with those tension things. You didn't say this, Jessica, but some people ask size of needle. It depends on the thread that you're using. So 9014 or an 8012, depending on the thread. So that was a bonus. Maybe nobody wanted to know that, but we threw that in there. <laughs> All right, so then I'm gonna go back into my little designs, little fillers. And what's nice about this is if I wanna put pebbles in between there, that's great. About four, five, six pebbles and I'm done. I'm ready to move on to a different design. Um, I think it's very obvious that I have uh, quilting ADD here. I don't, I don't mind switching it up on the fly and, and throwing all the things together. So it's a lot of fun. It lets me practice a new design without committing to it. Now I do wanna say that it might look awfully intricate with all these designs I'm doing, but you don't have to make it this detailed. Even if you're just combining a meandering line with a loop every once in a while, you're still gonna get a nice, interesting texture, and it's gonna help you progress into designs that maybe you don't know as well as another one. And we'll talk about that next week as well, how to use this technique to learn other designs, but it can be very helpful in learning as well. Any other questions? What design would I use to make it look like grass? All right, adding details with the quilting is so much fun and grass is definitely one of those. Um, I've quilted a few quilts with a little bit of grass and for that, we're just kind of going with texture. So one that I would like to do, I'm gonna turn it just a little bit, you can see, is kind of like a starburst, right? So I quilt kind of a straight line and then maybe I add a little bit of texture right there. So I just kind of went at an angle, went up and back and then continued on. Um, it's kind of fun because it just gives that little tuft of grass and then if I wanted to I can do another row right on top of it just kind of offset them a little bit so it looks 
I don't know, a little bit um, more laid out. I'll add another row so you can kind of see. So this is one technique I've used, especially, I mean, I probably wouldn't do this over the whole quilt, but I like that little, just little pop of texture. This design is a fun one because it can look like snowflakes, it can look like barbed wire, it can look like grass, it can look like stars, just depending on whatever you put it up against. Um, another thing you could do to give a, a kind of a grassy look is similar, but more of like a zigzag. So if I wanted to do like some rolling hills and then maybe just some back and forth lines, kind of adding a little zigzag there. Grass is tricky because I don't want to do this over the whole quilt. That will take forever. So I like to add just a few little kind of wavy lines and just little tufts as I'm going. Or maybe I might do this just towards the bottom of the area and then as it goes up it just turns into wavy lines. I'll try to remember, I have a picture of a quilt I did this on and it, I really liked how it turned out because I, to me it looked kind of like corn in the fields, but you know, that's, that's my Missouri showing right there, so there's that. This is how I would do grass. Um, again, I wouldn't just do zigzags over the whole area because it looks pretty messy when you do that, so hopefully that helps. Any other questions? Is there a tip for combining designs in a more narrow space like a three inch border? Definitely. So you're just gonna kind of focus on designs that are more linear. So here I'm kind of going in all different directions. In a border or a sashing, it's okay if there's a direction to it because it, that's what's going on there. You know, that's kind of how it is. So what I would do is kind of focus on halves. Maybe do one design in one half and one design in the other. Um, one that just comes to mind immediately is kind of like um, just a wavy line on one side. And I'm just gonna run it into my previous quilting here because I wanna fill in all those gaps, you know. Actually, hold on a second, my, my quilting OCD is gonna show up. I'm gonna add a pebble right there so I don't have a gap. <laughs> and then I might travel along the edge and then add another wavy line on the other side, right? So just kind of like an echo almost. And then fill in the area between them with something different. So even though this is, I mean, not combining designs like I'm doing here, it is definitely incorporating two different shapes. And what I'm gonna put inside is the ribbon candy. So that was another question that was there. Now, I wanna point out that doing the ribbon candy in an irregular area is not the best place to start. So when I do the live chat on that design, I'll make sure to show you like the beginner basics. But for ribbon candy, and actually I'm going to go over to the other side so I can move towards the camera. A little echoing. When I'm doing that ribbon candy, I'm quilting a line that curves out and back. And it's almost like a backwards S. And then I'm gonna swing out and add the next one. So the reason that this is tricky for quilters is there is that mirror image, right? So you have this shape that flips back and forth and it's like, I got it, I don't got it, I got it, I don't got it. So if you're having trouble with ribbon candy, tracing over it until it clicks will really help you out. And I did do a tutorial on this in the very, very first free motion challenge. So you can check out my YouTube channel and go find that. Um, but in the live chat, I'll make sure I have some printable diagrams that you can trace over and that will help you out. Again, the ribbon candy is kind of like the wishbone in that it can fill in those irregular areas, but it doesn't, doesn't go super wide. Like three inches is about as wide as I would use this design, maybe four inches, because it really spreads out, but um, adding those wavy lines can take an area and make it a little bit easier to fill in. Now, in the chat, people were talking about how tricky it is to make those ribbon candy touch, right? That, in a perfect world, as I loop around, my next one would touch it, not overlap it, not stop short, and then continue on. But in a perfect world, I wouldn't have to wind bobbins every time I want to quilt, right? I could just put a cone of thread under there. Um, if you're having trouble getting them to touch, stop just short, right? If, as long as you do it all the time, it's going to look intentional. And I would rather stop short than cross over, because crossing over, unless you do it intentionally, um, just looks not as good. So I might leave a little gap. It's okay as long as you always do it, even, even if it's up to an eighth of an inch. So stopping short all the time might help you out. Um, you can come up with some artistic reason for it. It'd be fine. But it would just look kind of like this. So instead of nudging them right next to each other, I'm just leaving a little gap um, just because just that's going to be easier for me. So don't fight it. Don't stress out about those little things. Just move on from it and, and it's going to be fine. So that's how I'd handle those more narrow kind of areas. Any other questions, Jex? So do I quilt my border separately? Do I treat it as a separate piece? Or do I just quilt an all over design, kind of extending that filler just over the border? And honestly, it depends. Like I know that's the, 
That's the answer I always give, and it's not the answer people like, but it does depend. So some scenarios. If I have a very large border, and I want something elegant that's gonna frame the center, I, I have room to add some beautiful feathers, then I would treat it separate. But let's pretend I have a border that's a busy fabric. Maybe it's a new cave fabric or a, a busy print. If you can't see the quilting anyway, I'm not gonna take the time to do something really intricate in that area. So that might be an instance where I would just extend that all over in the border. Um, or if I was on a time crunch. I mean, let's be honest, there's nothing like last minute to get something done. So if I'm in a time crunch, I might just you know, do that all over design, but I might do something special just in the border corners to give it a little custom look, but not take as long as doing something different in the whole border. Again, it totally depends on your preferences. So there's no right or wrong when it comes to that. Now, what I love about this combining designs technique is if you're learning how to quilt or you're, you know, kind of working through the designs, as you start throwing all this stuff together, as long as all the gaps are filled in, when you're done, all you're gonna see is that beautiful texture. Now, I'm using a thread color, this hot pink, so you can see what I'm doing. But if you're doing this technique on an actual quilt, you're probably gonna wanna use a thread color that blends in, and it's gonna be amazing how, when you stand back, it all just kinda blends together and you don't notice those mistakes, or like I like to call them, you know, um, unintentional, design ideas or customizations. So don't worry too much about the perfection of it as you're quilting, because when you're done, I promise, you step back, you'll forget where those are at. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of continue, again, quilting my bigger designs, filling in the gaps, and just kind of having fun with it. How about another question? Okay, so I just upgraded to a long arm. My swirls look very square now. Any suggestions? Oh, squared swirls or squirrels. Those are so much fun, right? Okay, you're just getting comfortable with the machine if you're changing from one to the other. It's gonna take a second to get that smooth movement and that flow. So the short answer is it's just gonna take a little practice, but I promise it won't take that long. You'll, you'll get it pretty quick. One thing that could help you, especially with swirls, is sometimes we think if we go slower or we take our time and we really focus on it, we'll get a better rounded shape, but that's actually not the case. Um, we want momentum to help us get that nice, smooth um, outer si uh, curl to the swirl. So try moving a little faster. And if you're using your stitch regulator, maybe try manual and see if that helps you out to get that momentum down. But I promise either way, it's not gonna take very long to get the hang of it. Very common. I always tell people in my classes, if you get those squared swirls, um, think of it as encouragement. You're like 75% of the way there. You're almost there, so you'll, you'll be there soon. Just threw a couple little wishbones in the designs. Again, it's so nice to be able to practice in just little bits and then not have to commit to doing it everywhere. So if I did a couple little wishbone and I'm like, oh, that looks horrible, maybe I don't do it for a while. Maybe I just go on to another design. You, don't, you definitely don't have to keep at it at that point. I mean, I think you should keep practicing, but if you're stressing out, we, nobody wants that. Ooh. Any other questions? <laughs> What stitch length am I using? Don't you, you can probably see on the screen, it's very big. It's, I'm into the big stitch machine quilting. I actually don't use a regulator, so my stitch length is a little bit more organic, so it, it varies in size. Here, it's gonna be a little bit bigger than I would normally have it when I'm quilting because I'm trying to quilt slow so the machine doesn't overpower the sound of my voice. So I'm not used to quilting quite this slow. Really consistent stitch length, if you don't have a stitch regulator, that consistent stitch length will come with practice, okay? So it's kind of like trying to worry about what your handwriting is gonna look like when you're still learning the letters. The more you do it, the more it will even out. So try not to worry too much about it right now. Um, that, again, that wasn't a question you asked, but that's usually right next on the, on the list. Another question? Yes. Is there a quilting design that's easier to start and learn? Like, what should you start with, right? You're like, okay, I'm watching this and I, I'm gonna try it out. And we're gonna actually talk about that in depth next week. Um, but really, any design that you want to quilt is the one you should start with. I know you're like, okay, that doesn't help. These aren't like math. They don't build off each other. I mean, there are designs that are more similar, but it's not like you have to learn these before you learn another one. So first of all, it has to be one that you wanna quilt. That aside, if you're like, I don't know what I want to quilt, you could start with a meandering line. So 
that meandering line, and we're gonna see this a lot next week, is just a line that goes in all different directions. This is like your classic meander. Now the trick to the meandering line is you wanna move as smoothly as possible. You wanna go in a lot of different directions so that there's not a noticeable pattern, if possible. Most important, you just need to breathe, right? That's rule number one. But if you can breathe and think, then you can kind of focus on that other stuff. What I like to do is I kind of imagine a line, this is gonna sound silly, but you guys won't judge me, I know you won't. I kind of imagine this line is like a river. You know how you just go in all different directions? Um, I wanna force myself to go in all different directions. And so we live in Kansas City, outside of Kansas City, we have the Missouri River, which you know you have to cross three times before you get out of the state. So it's, I have the perfect visual reference right there. Um, but another thing that could help is make yourself go in all different directions. So you can say left, up, right, down, or whatever you have to give yourself to make yourself go in all different directions. So this is usually the classic one that people start with. But let's say you kind of, you get it down, you're like, all right, great, I've got the meandering line, I'm the meandering queen of Liberty, Missouri, that's awesome. Now I can build off of that and combine designs to learn something new. So let's say you're the next one, you're like, ooh, maybe I wanna do a loopy meander. Maybe I want something that looks like circles on my quilts. So we can use that meandering line Again, to fill in any of those little areas, I'm working it up into those gaps. I don't want any gaps in my quilting. And then when I'm ready, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I could do this, right? Deep breath. I can add just a little loop and then go right back into my meandering line, right? And so I'm kind of using something that I feel comfortable doing to transition to something that might not feel so comfortable. And then as, as I feel led, as I have a sip of my wine, I might add more of those loops. And what starts to happen is now, I'm kind of using that other design to transfer into this one. And so as I start adding pebbles, maybe I do that over a whole, pebbles, sorry. As I start adding loops, maybe I do that over a whole quilt. Maybe I'm ready to learn something new. Maybe I can do a figure eight, right? So go into one pebble and right into the other. You can see right there, cute little guy. Say, no problem, right? Most of us know how to do a figure eight because we've written eights. I just do one loop and then do my next and then go right back to my meandering line. So I'm using, again, kind of building off of it. So adding a loop, maybe two. And then as you progress, kind of challenge yourself to add more things, right? Maybe you're like, okay, you know what? I can do three. I bet I can do three. Do one, two, and then three. And like, and now I'm going back to my meandering line. The trick, I mean, as long as you do it consistently or do the some, same thing over and over again, even if it's not perfect in your mind, it's gonna look perfect. So it's gonna look right because you're doing it all the time. And what's fun about loops is you can change up the shape and get a slightly different look. Maybe I want it to look more like leaves. All I have to do is get a little pointy leaf. Or maybe I don't wanna learn how to do loops. Maybe I don't wanna get a little loopy. I could do swirls instead. I could just quote my swirl echo out and be like, okay, enough of that. I'm going right into my meandering line. So I know that's a very, very long answer to the question, but the main idea is that you can quilt any designs you want in any order, but use something that you already know to transition into something that you want to do. If you look at a design and you're like, I don't like how that looks, I don't want to do it, don't bother learning it. There's no reason to if you're not going to use it. So that was a long answer to the question. <laughs> and another question? Ooh, tips for quilting words or phrases. That's one of my favorite. So that's a, a really fun way to add details. Now, I want to get over here because I've got, I know, a nice straight kind of line to work with. So I'm going to use echoing, echoing around my area to get over there. All right, so quilting words, of course, the biggest thing is going to be I want to work left to right. I mean, honestly, because that's how we write. I'm not going to be trying to do anything different than that. So I'm going to use like a wavy line. Let's see here, we can see, turn a little bit those wavy lines I put around my wishbone. And that's gonna act as kind of like the bottom of my, my line that I wanna work on. Um, so maybe I can, from there, work my way to the left and I can start quilting the words. The great thing is if you learned cursive in school, you can have no problem, you can do that. Ooh, shredded thread. I'm just kinda surprised it hasn't happened yet. All right, so when that happens, I'm gonna rethread my machine. Maybe I was moving too irregularly, maybe I wasn't quite moving the way I need to. If this happens, and this is a question that comes up sometimes, but I have my like gross stuff right here. I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to kind of take that out, get it to where it's nice again. And then I'm going to start my next line of quilting so that it overlaps it by about a half an inch or so. And that's just going to help kind of secure it as I start quilting. 
Um, and this is how it would handle like empty bob, like when the bobbin runs out, something like that. Normally, I would tie off if I was going to just stop, but if it breaks, I don't have that option. Okay, this would be a teachable moment. I love it. So here's my quilting. What I'm going to do is overlap it by about a half an inch. And holding my top thread, I'm going to take a stitch down and up. And what I'm doing is grabbing that bobbin thread so now it's on the top. And now that I have them both on the top, that means I won't get any nests or little, you know, thread nests on the back. And then I might take a couple stitches in place. So I'm just pushing my needle up and down button, or I could use my hand wheel. And then I'm going to just start quilting. So I'm going to go into my letter. I was going to do an H. And then over here, I'll just come over and I'll trim it off flush with the quilt like that. Now, if I have the choice, and I'll clean this up just a bit. If I have the choice, I might take that quilting out to like a seam or a busier fabric so it's not quite as noticeable, um, but I'm not stressed out about it. Now, I know there's some of you out there that like to bury your threads, and that's totally fine. Um, I don't bury the threads. I always clip them yeah, because I, I feel like it secures it enough with those stitches to help hold it in place. And if you've ever taken out quilting, you know that stuff doesn't just come out, right? It's like two seconds to put in, 20 minutes to take out. So there is that. If you're worried about that, though, you can put a little dab of fray check or fabric glue on it. It just kind of helps secure it. So with the words, I'm just quilting like I would write it, cursive. But to go into the next one, I'm just going to kind of add another little, little like wavy line just to give it some separation. I don't want to jam those words right up next to each other because it would be hard to see what they say. And um, maybe I'll do quilting. There's only a few letters that will give you trouble. That's the I and the T and the Z and all those. What I'm going to do, so I'm at my I, I'm just going to add my little dot while I'm there and then move on. Happy quilting. Now I have, um, <laughs> I have quilted this several times, so I've had a little practice. Now that's if I'm doing cursive. There's a different way that you could do more block letters. We won't really get into that. It's a little bit more thought out, a little bit more marking, but maybe I'll do a live chat on that in the future. Now one thing I think would be so fun, and somebody should do this, I think it'd be cool on a sewing machine to quilt it so that it, the words work in a spiral because you can just rotate the quilt as you go. Wouldn't that be neat? Um, that wouldn't be super easy on a long arm. In fact, darn near impossible, but on a sewing machine, it'd be lots of fun. Then once I have my words, then I can just continue to fill around it. Now, here's the question I have to ask myself. Do I want these words to really stand out? Like I want it to be obvious to people. If I do, I'm going to leave some gap above it, right? Because that gap in the quilting will draw attention. Remember I said people will notice a gap in the quilting before they notice an error. If I want the words to be more subtle or more blended in, I'll add some echoes or swirls or I'll fill in the space between the letters um, just so they kind of blend in. That would be more, you know, for like hidden messages or little details or, you know, stuff like that. And I, I've done it both ways. Kind of fun. Again, making sure I fill in all those gaps while I'm there. I could echo Paisley's little pebbles, meandering line, anything. Just make sure I fill it in. And then go into my next design. Any other questions? So talking about doodling the designs, um, by the way, <laughs> I taught in England and I was like doodle, or Australia, doodle, 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 doodle. Apparently in, over there, it's like that's a little boy going to the bathroom. So if some of you are listening to this and just cracking up, that's not what it means over here, right? So it just means to draw out the design. Um, drawing out the designs or doodling is a great practice. Now, all the time, all the time people are like, but I'm not good at drawing. You're not trying to be good at drawing. You're just trying to learn how the design goes together. You haven't seen my handwriting. It doesn't matter. It's not for your hands. It's for your mind. 80% of quilting is just knowing where you're going. And when you try drawing it out, you'll learn the path. You'll learn how to get unstuck. You'll learn how to handle those areas. And it was really gratifying because somebody, I can't remember now who, but it's one of you guys that watched on the live chat, totally messaged and was like on the chat, I finally did it. I didn't believe you, but I did it and it does help. So especially when you can't be at your quilting machine, Right? You're like at a business meeting, a family gathering, something like that. It's perfect because you can kind of work in filling that out. Um, I think it's important to fill in a defined area. So like drawing out some kind of square or shape and then filling it in with the design is really good practice because it makes you learn how to deal with corners and it makes you learn how to fill in a whole area. And then also lets you see when you're done that it all just blends together. So um, please take my advice on that. If you want to learn a design, doodling is a great way to do it. But, or just actual quilting, either way. 
I always like to see, I'm going to show how long ago I've been quilting. So back in the day, when I started long arm quilting, there were no smartphones. And so I always use the Magnadoodle. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. Like you draw on it and you just erase it and draw on it. I mean, it was my son's, but I loved it. And I practiced my feathers on it and you just erase it and then it goes away. It's perfect. So, um, and, but any drawing app would be great. I mean, you don't even need, you don't need necessarily proof that it happens. So you can just kind of erase it as you go. Or a dry erase board is really fun. I have a big mirror in my um, quilting room. And so I'll draw out designs sometimes if I'm trying to see how they flow together. So that works out great too. Um, so really some good options for you. Let's take a couple more questions and then I think we'll wrap up. Ooh, swirl hooks. Yes, I love swirl hooks. Of course, let's be honest, I love all the designs, right? It's just kind of how it is. So the difference between a swirl and a swirl hook is on the swirl hook, I'm gonna add an extra little step. So there's my curl, right? So we saw that first step, my first little curl, but my next move is not gonna be to finish the swirl like I've told you already, like told you before, we're changing it up. I'm gonna quilt a line that goes out and extends out. So it kind of comes in and it just goes out to a point. Then, which I kept it close to this other swirl, then I'm gonna echo back around that point and then echo back around the swirl. Now I have several tutorials on this, so you'll have to check it out because I do um, share it a little bit more detail. But here's the thing about the swirl hook. Keep that hook close to something else. Don't just stick it out in the middle of the area because it's gonna create some um, gaps that you'll have to fill in later, which is fine, but it's gonna be a lot easier if you keep that hook close to something else. Now I'll say again, uh, another thing I'll mention is Sometimes we get in the habit of going in one direction, so I need to make sure I use echoing to maneuver around. So I'm echoing around. And then again, it doesn't matter how long that hook is, I just wanna keep it close to something else. And a, what's really great about that is it's basically just a swirl. So if I just wanna throw one in every once in a while, maybe I don't wanna you know, do all the swirl hooks, maybe I just all of a sudden feel like I can do it, then maybe that would be the way to go. Just drop my pedal, that's not cool. So let me do just a couple more so you can see it. Again, swirl, keep that hook close to something else. I'm not worried about which direction the swirl is facing. I am trying to fill in all the area and I'm trying to go in all different, like move around. I don't wanna go in a straight line. And okay, I admit I'm probably showing off a little bit, but once you get the hang of it, you can actually add two hooks. I know, now that's just being silly, isn't it? I don't do that a whole lot, but sometimes you could. <laughs> I like swirl hooks for more masculine quilts. Um, I especially like them if I have something that wants to look like fire, or I just have a quilt with a lot of irregular shaped backgrounds, like around stars, because those points can really get into those areas and fill it in without having to try to cram a swirl in there. All right, Jex, what's the last lucky question? She got a pick, huh? Okay, last one. Wait for the request to see how fast you normally quilt. <laughs> how fast I normally quilt. Okay how fast do I quilt and, and show an example. Okay, so it depends on the design. If I'm working with pebbles, I'm not gonna be going as fast, right? I'm gonna be kind of moderating that speed because I'm quilting smaller. But as you get into those more fluid shapes, you can really go a little bit faster. Now you just gotta find that happy, that happy space between your hands and your feet. And I'm trying to make my feet match my hands. I hope that makes sense. My hands know how fast they want to move. I'm going to adjust the pedal. I'm not going to adjust my hands. That's the that's a tricky part. That's just learning the design. Um, but usually, what slows me down less than quilting is having to reposition my hands. I'm not so great at that. But this would be kind of the speed I would normally go on a sewing machine. On a long arm, again, it's, it's, it depends on the design. I probably go faster on my long arm than I do on my sewing machine. I'm not in stitch regulated. And I, every long arm has a different um, way they measure, but mine is a speed percentage. I have the Handy Quilter Avante. So usually I'm around 70 to 78% is usually where I'm at in there. So the trick is this, you don't have to quilt as fast as I do. You need to quilt fast enough that you can't critique the job you're doing while you're doing it, right? So if you're saying, ooh, the swirl isn't looking very good, that's too slow. But you don't wanna go so fast that you're out of control, right? Because then you can't get good uh, results. So just know that you're gonna find that happy speed and it's gonna change. I mean, if I'm listening to some mellow music and I have my glass of wine, maybe I don't quilt as fast. If I'm listening to something a little harder, a little faster, I might quilt a little faster. So let me come back out of there. So hopefully this demo has kind of showed you a little bit of how it progresses. It turned out so cute. I mean, lots of quilting. 
And um, it's a really fun technique that you can use to not only learn new designs, but do so much with. And I'm gonna talk about that in our next week's live chat, where I'll demo again, but I'll be showing specific techniques and uh, lots of quilted examples. So I hope you'll join me for then. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I can bother time from time and answer. Um, but let me know what you think about this format. Do you like the live demo? Do you like, you know, would you rather see more pictures? Tell me what you wanna see and I'll definitely try to make that happen. Well, thanks so much for joining me for another weekly live chat and demo. I'll see you next Thursday at 3 p.m. Central for the second part of the video series. Until then, everybody stay safe and happy quilting.